Good afternoon. I'm Diana Lawson. I'm the Dean of the Seidman College of Business, and I would like to welcome you to this COVID-19 webinar for West Michigan businesses. Today, the webinar, I think, will hit home for a lot of small businesses in the area that have been facing a number of different types of challenges as they move through COVID-19. The title of today's webinar is Successful Small Business Pivots. We have as our moderator, one of our longtime growth consultants from the Michigan SBDC, Brooks Kindle. So I'm going to turn this over to Brooks and have him introduce the panelists. I think we will have a really good discussion. Thank you all for being here. Brooks. Thank you, Dean Lawson. I uh, wanted to introduce our two panelists today. Uh, I think they both have an interesting story to, to share with our attendees. Dr. Erica Armstrong, um, has a uh, medical practice with a side business of producing uh, healthy food. And I'll let her explain that in more detail in a minute. And Steve Birkenpass is CFO of Primera Plastics, a manufacturing operation uh, that uh, produces all sorts of things for several different industries. So I'll uh, start with Erica and, and let you uh, talk a little bit about um, yourselves and an overview of your business. Thanks, Brooks. My business is called Root, and we are a functional medicine and nutrition practice. We were fairly new when COVID hit, about a year and a half old. We started in a small co-working space doing clinical consultations in downtown Grand Rapids, and we had moved to our space on Wealthy Street about six months before. But essentially what we do is we work with clients closely. We're a team of doctors and dietitians, and we use natural therapies and food as medicine to solve health problems that are going un unsolved in conventional medicine. When we decided that our food plans were a key part of the progress our clients were making, we decided to start cooking those meals for people to make things easier. And so um, we hired a dietitian chef and she cooks them in the incubator kitchen in downtown market. And then um, our clients and then other community members come pick them up every Monday in a meal subscription service. Thank you. Steve, tell us a little bit about uh, where you work. I'm Steve Birkenpass. I work for Primera Plastics in Zealand, and we are a tier two um, precision injection molder, mainly for the automotive industry. Um, and we also do some furniture work. So, um, and also a little medical furniture work. And so as we get into it later, we've kind of diversified over the last few months, um, but we're about 25 years old. I've been with the company for about 12 years. Well, thank you. Let's set the stage then for uh, um, what's been going on. So Erica, we'll start with you. Take us back through the mists of time to the weeks before COVID became front page news and the shelter in place order uh, was put into effect. How was your business? And when did you start feeling concerned and did you make any changes or plans at that time? We had steady growth at the time. Each month we were growing and more clients that we were working with and more word of mouth, um, even nationally. And uh, we had actually planned the meal service starting in about January, um, but it was something that we're, we were thinking about, oh, this would, be, this would be nice, this would be great if we could offer this. And uh, in, the, in the weeks heading up to COVID, we really started focusing more on that. And once, um, once we all had to go home and go virtual, it was quite a transition because we have a very personal business and people like to be here in person with us. Um, and we had to transfer a lot of that consultations to online. And so we had to um, help people understand that we could still perform the same level of service through a computer screen, even though it feels different. Um, and we also, um, focused a lot of our energy on creating, getting the meal service going. Having something to work on was very positive and uplifting for our team, and it really drove some of the innovation, and things happened very quickly at that point. Did I answer all your questions, Brooks, or was, did, I, did I miss something? You, d you did a great job. <laughs> Just a, a quick follow-up, though. Did, did any of your uh, clients have hesitation about going to an online 
uh, type interaction? We actually thought more people would be hesitant than, than were. Um, our team here made a quick video um, of how easy it would actually be to just click on the link and how we would interact and how we would send the plan via email and send links to certain supplements or things that we recommended. And um, I, I do think that was really helpful. We put that up on Facebook and then um, as we were changing everyone over to virtual, we sent a link to that video from Facebook and then we didn't really receive much, much pushback at all. Interesting. Well, same question for you, Steve. Uh, you know, how was business pre-lockdown and, and when did uh, you start sensing that something was uh, uh, happening and did you start making plans or changes at that time? Well, yeah, it seems like a lifetime ago, March. But uh, yeah, we, uh, we started hearing about COVID and um, right away started you know, paying attention um, our senior management team has had a few years in the business, so we've been around the block a few times and we've seen some different health issues over the years. But uh, yeah, we started really just asking questions of ourselves and we started planning, you know, a couple of different options. What does it look like? Um, we were in a unique position and it, it became a lot of learning for us because when, it, when the lockdown first happened, um, there was a lot of discussion of who could be open and who couldn't be open. And um, there was a lot of discussion of whether we were deemed essential. There was a portion of our business, as I had said earlier, we were in the medical furniture field and some of those did fit that criteria very easily. And so we were able to keep some people on for that and then we had to figure it out. And same thing with the office staff, who, who can work remotely and who can't. Um, because of supporting a manufacturing operation of, you know, 100 people. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you, you went through a, a process of information gathering, and I was curious about what resources you utilized or, or sources that you found particularly helpful. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, we, uh, I don't know if everyone else did, but I got bombarded with emails, with <laughs> webinars, and I found a, a few that I, I just found that they were helpful. One was a, a law firm. We worked with our law firm. They had several. We had a CPA firm that had some. And, you know, obviously back in that day, like I said, a lifetime ago, the rules were changing uh, minute by minute. And so we, uh, I, I think my majority of my time was spent on webinars and researching what all this meant. And obviously, like I said, we came up with some plans of what does this mean if we're 20% open or 80% open or 100% open. So um, just a lot of research and, you know, in today's world, the internet helps with that. Erica, when the uh, dust settled from the the initial shock of the shelter in place order. Could you kind of walk us through your thought process, processes as you assess the situation and determine priorities for your business in order to uh, determine how you were going to pivot? Yes, so luckily the, the team around me um, is very aware of the startup environment and the pivots that happen and they were all very flexible and we really have such a great um, a team minded approach where some people really didn't mind staying home with their young kids and they reduced their hours and we were um, able to then focus more on using hours to getting the, the food service going and diverting some of our attention and funds that way. Um, we, we have a, a membership model practice and so people are in three and six month programs and so I kind of breathed a little sigh of relief. Okay, we do have clients that are still going to be coming with us for at least, you know, three or four more months. Um, so I do think that was key in, in keeping us going. Um, but at the same time, I thought, okay, how much time do I have? And I would, I would calculate how many payrolls we would have before we had to start getting new clients. And that's when I started to get nervous because we were getting about um, signing up about six new clients a week very, very steadily. And then for two weeks, we heard nothing. And I thought, okay, <laughs> how much time do we have? And then we just, we just planned it accordingly. And um, we had a team who was 
who is willing to um, step up or step back as needed. What resources did you find helpful when you were going through this process? Well, um, I use the telemedicine um, website. Can't remember exactly what it's called, but there was a pretty um, big decision that helped our business and that was um, telehealth laws lifted for um, being able to consult with people across state lines without them having to travel to us. We actually have had people fly from the East Coast to see us and that was really exciting, but then it was really exciting when they didn't have to do that anymore and we could actually just do our, our programs um, completely online. So following that website was really helpful and then um, uh, functional medicine is such a niche, tight-knit community that I have some forums on Facebook and what, what is everyone else doing here? And so, so that was uh, the one benefit of, of having a Facebook. Well, um, reflecting on the, the challenges of moving your business down a, a different path and on a shortened timeline, what worked and what didn't work for you as you pivoted your business? I'll toss that to Steve first. So in other words, what is it you did to fill in the uh, opportunities that uh, you needed to keep things going and, uh, you know, lessons learned along the way, challenges and so forth? Yeah, it was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we were in automotive a, a good percentage. And so it was suddenly, uh, turned off there because the, the big three and most of them shut down for health reasons. Obviously safety was our number one concern. And it was just so happened that uh, we were working with a local hospital here in West Michigan on uh, a different project. Um, and they kind of came in and said, what, what can you do to help us for PPE? And they gave us kind of a catalog and said, here's some ideas. And so um, we actually came up with a, a it was a cool idea, but I guess it's a simple idea is we actually make face shields. So um, we came up with a prototype with them and said, what do you think? And they loved it. And so then it, then it became, okay, now we need to produce these things and we have to pivot. Not only obviously the idea of making these, how are we going to make these? Because keep in mind, this was back when everything was shut down virtually. And so now we need people to work and how do we keep them safe as well as getting the work done. And so it was a lot of time spent on how do we get the product. Um, we were very early on um, reading a lot of CDC information of what can we do, what should we do to keep the employees safe. So a lot of our time at the beginning of that was obviously spent um, developing this product and then at the same time I was working on and with, a, with another group the how do we keep everybody safe if we need to produce it. Did you have supp supply chain issues that uh, were also problematical in terms of getting raw materials and pieces and parts? Well it, it was interesting because we had never produced these before and uh, there is a plastic shield at the, in the face and that we don't we don't mold that um, so we tried to get it. We got numerous samples in, and obviously a lot of companies um, were doing similar things. And so we, we worked with the supply chain and we actually found a great partner who said we have capacity as well as the raw materials. And so we were worried about it for a while, but it actually worked out in the long run that we, we had it. And we're still using and, we're still using that same source today. And talk to me a little bit about how uh, you worked with your employees to to come back um, to work, and did the uh, supplemental unemployment benefits create additional issues? Uh, and how did you keep uh, everyone safe and socially distanced, and all of those things that are important? Sure. Um, well, I'll give the credit where the credit's due. Our HR person uh, worked her magic and uh, because she actually called all of our people and, and it really helped, obviously with the automotive piece of it and injection molding, 
there was some concerns and we, we were able to get people obviously doing that. But when it came to the shields, it, it helped us to be able to say, this is a PPE product to help keep people safe. And actually everyone was on board. We got, I'm pretty sure we got everybody back that we didn't have any problems. Um, you know, that was in the early stages. So we were pretty early in the, the pandemic and that was before any of the unemployment benefits were even being checks were going out, let alone the $600 check. So obviously everybody wanted to come back to work for that. And like I said, it, it really helped that it was a personal product and that we were, we really, you know, we believe in this wholeheartedly that we're helping in this time of need. Erica, I know that um, you have been uh, working on the food side of your business uh, in the last few months. You want to talk a little bit about how that has played into this whole thing? Yes, so we launched uh, the first weekly subscription of our meal service. I think it was the uh, second week of the complete shutdown. So in some ways, the timing for us worked out pretty well because people still needed to eat and they didn't want to go to the grocery store. And um, there were some food um, shortages, which actually were some of our challenges that we, we faced. We set a team of six people out to different grocery stores at one point trying to find all the stuff that we needed um, to make the meals on Monday. Um, but yeah, so, so that launched and then um, each week we would get a couple more subscribers no one at the time wanted to talk about a new business in the media. Everyone wanted to talk about COVID and that's it. So we actually got a start without um, any publicity at all other than, other than social media and then our own clients and word of mouth. So it did actually let us grow nicely, gradually, where we could fix some of the issues that we might not have been able to put as much attention on if, if we had a suddenly a huge amount of subscribers at once. So. Looking back, you know, it all worked out, although we weren't sure how we were going to get this word out. Um, and then eventually we did, we did get a, a, a nice article that the downtown market helped us with that helped. Great, thank you. I should mention too for the attendees that if, if you would like to submit a question for uh, either Steve or Erica, you can do that through the um, Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. You should have a little icon and uh, We'd be happy to uh, do the best we can answering any questions you have. Um, Steve, what, what made the difference, do you think, in successfully pivoting? You know, it sounds like it was a combination of, of doing your homework and uh, a little bit of lucky relationship with um, a customer and and uh, diligence on the part of your staff. Is there anything else that you would say was part of that success? Well, I think you kind of summarized it in a way. And like I said, I believe in um, passing on the, the, the praise and, you know, we have a great team here. And so everybody was pivoting at the same time on different things. You know, we were trying to, to get the supply chain. We were trying to get the labor. We were trying to you know, look at what we did and, um, you know, literally overnight, um, we were pivoting to making this, this face shield. And it was just, it was a group effort. There was no one person that was leading the charge. I mean, there was obviously management in, in that place, but we all did our own part. It sounds like uh, the sense of purpose or mission was very important on, for both of you in this. Um, question from the audience is, how have you continued to motivate your team members? Erica? I, I mean, I think it's that comes back to that sense of purpose and mission. We're doing something to make functional medicine um, accessible and easy to our community. And it's something that um, 
in the past, functional medicine has, has been very expensive and inaccessible, but by taking our food plans that we know work and then creating these meals that people can just drive by and pick up, we really feel like we're contributing to, you know, less inflammation in our community and um, healthier lifestyles and all those things that are really important right now. And, and I think that keeps our, our team motivated. And as Steve said, every single person contributed to getting our meals off the ground. We had the dietitians making the food plans, the dietitian chef cooking them. Um, making the labels. We had our director of client experience designing those. We did everything in-house and so it was just really fun to watch this all come together and seeing each person's unique talents come out and I feel like when you're in a challenging time it, it almost makes those talents um, come out you know, to more of an extent but yeah, just keeping everyone involved in the way that they wanted to be involved and then down to that, that sense of purpose and what we were doing. Anything to add to that, Steve? Oh, um, obviously we're, we're in a little different situation. Um, Erica has a, a newer endeavor going and, you know, we've been in place for 25 years and our owner has always been the same owner. Um, and he's always tried to have have the family environment in this organization and so we were it was the sense of purpose and it was we're in this together and you know you had asked earlier and you forgot to remind me but um you had mentioned you know what did we do and our our production facility is in such that for the most part there's distancing between our machines but with making these we made sure that each workstation was separate um you know Obviously, our lunchroom we had to, to rearrange and, and stuff like that. So it really helped the fact that we already were established. These, these weren't, you know, we weren't trying to hire them at the time, and we were just trying to really say, can you help us? And again, like I said, it, it, it did help for the fact that it was, a, it was a, a personal product, and there was personal pride. Everyone here has personal pride in the organization. You know, it's really interesting if I can uh, sort of take a sideline here a minute. Um, at the Small Business Development Center where I work, we just, uh, as a matter of fact, today released uh, an ebook called Focus 4, which is a, a business planning methodology that a number of us have put together over the course of the last year. And it borrows from uh, Gino Wickman and Vern Harnish and Jim Collins and Michael Gerber, all of the business gurus. And the premise of this is, is, as the name implies, first of all, there's focus, but that sense of, you know, making sure everybody understands the, the core values of the business, the core purpose, you make sure you get the right people in the right seats. And uh, it sounds like both of you, uh, uh, are examples of how well that can work when you have that kind of a business that's, uh, you know, teamwork, focus, accountability, creativity, and all of those things. Um, I'm uh, curious about what, and this is a kind of an interesting question, because uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, March seems like on one hand a lifetime ago and a, on the other hand, like last week. Um, but what do you know now about running uh, your business or managing your business that you wish you had known before COVID? Erica? Um, you know it the the online the, the website development and the content that we started pushing out we realized how how effective that that is and we we didn't really put much focus on it beforehand so um lately we've we've been trying to be more consistent with our messaging on instagram and facebook just trying to have consistent posts with helpful tips and things and then um, spending more time with actually engaging our email list and um, driving them back to our website just to continue to be a, be a presence in someone's life, even if they're not ready to work with us. Um, I think that was an important lesson that we learned. It sounds like social media for a B2C business is critically important. Steve? Um, yeah, we, I guess I'll say we didn't know what we didn't know, which like I said, it was, it was we knew we had good people, but it was kind of, we look back and go, you know, it was such a team environment. We have, we have a conference room here and it was, 
full of different parts and pieces. And I'd, I'd walk by there and there'd be eight people in there trying to work on this. And so I think what we learned is we need to keep the lines of communication open with our employees as well as our customers, obviously, because that's how this all started. But uh, how, you can, how you can bring your team in at the, the ground level and, and you know, we had three engineers in the room, I think, three or four. And uh, so it was, it was very enlightening and we just want to keep that. You know, we had, back to, you know, planning, we had always wanted to diversify into another um, line of business, so to speak. And so we had always wanted to get into medical supplies anyway. And so this kind of just helped, again, right place, right time. The door opened, huh? Yeah. So you think you'll continue on uh, exploring opportunities in the, the medical uh, materials market? Um, we will. Um, one of the things that we decided early on was that we did want to do this. Uh, and early on, everyone was under the, you know, the government rules, which basically said, make it and you can sell it kind of thing. And uh, we actually were able to, and we invested, we invested a lot of time and resources to get our product FDA listed. And so it's, that's how it works with, with this particular product. And so it's on our website and our plan is to continue to offer this long-term as well as short-term. Give you both an opportunity to uh, uh, impart knowledge and wisdom um, based on your expertise and, and experience, what steps should small businesses take today to mitigate the risks that COVID has created? Erica? Uh, I certainly don't feel like an expert on this, but <laughs> thank you for saying that. Um, you know, I, I've been a small business owner for less than two years now, so I am definitely still learning, but I actually think that's one of the things I, I will say is important is to keep a growth mindset and um, keep using everything as a learning experience. Yes, there were challenges, but every time we faced one, we tried to innovate. And just having that kind of um, an attitude all around me, um, there were definitely some days that I was worried for us but um i instead of sitting around worrying we just kept innovating and so by the time we had innovated 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 we're actually you know back ahead of where we left off back in march so it does it does eventually <laughs> come back just kind of keeping that positive team around you and keep um keep innovating and keep a growth mindset thank you what advice do you have steve well i think um Erica said it well, and uh, because we don't believe that we're any experts in this by any way, shape, or form. But I think uh, the, the key is to be willing to say, I don't know, and ask questions and research, um, because I'm still researching the latest and greatest of you know, what COVID means for businesses. And as it continues to gear up and the state opens more, and you know, so I think that the, the big, the big lesson that we've always learned as well as been good at as a company is to not be afraid to ask questions and to listen to other experts. Um, has this experience changed the way you will manage your business after COVID? I mean, I guess this way, specifically, I think she's already answered this in part, but will your pivot be a short term or do you plan to stay on this course post COVID? We're planning to stay on this course um, as, as long as we can. And um, we're actually putting more and more energy into our meals. We're getting requests um, to have them shipped. And so um, that is our next step in our business is to, is to um, keep expanding our reach with being able to give people healthy food. Well, and I was, yeah, I was just gonna interject there. I think uh, I'll, I'll throw it back on you, Brooks. Uh, what does post COVID look like? <laughs> I think we're all starting to 
realize that it's going to be something different. And to Erica's point, um, I think we have to continually pivot right now. And whatever that means, we need to be nimble and uh, be able to, to work through that. So yeah, we're, we're not too post COVID, but again, our plan is to continue our, our product and maybe expand it. And, um, but again, every day is a new day on what's going on. Well, you know, it's interesting anecdotally um, uh, from our perspective as uh, consultants with the SBDC, we see the clients that have, as Erica said, focused on innovation and growth and working the problem and looking forward. And by and large, they're the ones that um, are going to survive this and perhaps even uh, really prosper from it as a result. Um, whereas, you know, some clients are, seem to be a little more concerned with PPP forgiveness and, and all the financial relief, which is important, but you got to have a, a business at the end of whatever this period of time is. And so the, the, we see the people that are focusing on solving business problems, innovating, staying close to their customers, engaging, are the ones that are doing well. I have another audience question here. Uh, question is, what kind of technology investments did you make to facilitate remote workers? Or were there any really any tools you found or used to make your company run better out of necessity? Erica? Uh, well, we were lucky that Zoom was free, so we just used that for our team, team meetings. Um, and then our um, health records company actually came out with a video platform that made our lives a lot easier, and we did invest in that. It was an extra charge for the monthly fee to have that. But those were really the the main, you know, investments that we had to make was just that that uh, health record add on. Steve, yeah, again, we're in a little bit different, unique situation because we're manufacturing. So from a, a manufacturing perspective, we had to move a few things around, but not spend a lot of money. Um, it didn't take a, a lot of investment because it was pretty much set up that way. Um, from a technology standpoint, again, we're, you know, we're 25 years old, so we had a lot of things in place for our office personnel to be able to remote in from home before this. And so that allowed them to do that um, as needed. Again, they were on site and or off site, depending on what we needed at that time um, for our manufacturing. But uh, we, we didn't have to invest a lot because we had already had a good infrastructure. Well, you know, if you think about it, if this whole uh, pandemic had happened before the internet and social media and all of that, it would be a very, very different world right now. Um, I guess we're very fortunate that we have the technology we do. Um, do you have any other thoughts that you, you'd like to share with our audience? Um, Well, I guess I'll tell you what, I'll give you a question while you think about that. Okay. Another audience question. How, uh, how did your competitors respond to your business pivots? We are kind of a niche business in, in Grand Rapids. I think we're the only functional medicine um, business. So I didn't, I didn't really pay attention to um, competitors as as much as maybe I should have, but we, we were so focused on what we were doing that um, I'm, I'm not really sure how they responded. Well, yeah, from our perspective, we, we really didn't, it was something brand new. So we didn't really, there was obviously people that made them in the past and obviously there was no, no surplus. So we actually did some work for FEMA. We provided some to FEMA. So, uh, but same thing as Eric, I mean, we were so busy trying to get it done. Um, now we're looking at it and you know, trying to establish it for a longer term, but at the time, and it, we didn't really look at that. It was all about getting it done. You know, it's interesting when my uh, daughters were both young, they were on a swim team and I kept telling them to swim their own race. Don't worry about the 
people in the lanes next to you. And uh, I think you both uh, uh, talked about uh, how important that is. Was the government relief funds, whether it's the federal stuff or state, local, was that helpful? And um, how easy or difficult did it did you find uh, to navigate that whole process? Well, Brooks, I, this is a thank you to you because you, you helped me a lot with this. Um, <laughs> yeah, but you know, if I didn't have your help, it, it was very difficult to figure out how to, how to apply for the PPP loan. And um, there weren't very many banks that would even call you back when you're a small, uh, smaller business. So I, um, I had to be really persistent and um, it, it took a lot of my time, but I just wanted that cushion, especially early on. Um, when we didn't know if we were going to get more signups. So, but yeah, that was the, the one thing that we applied for was the PPP loan and we didn't really um, go after anything else. Steve? Yeah, it, um, you and I talked a few times, I think, over the course of time about different programs. Yes, we did. <laughs> um, our bank was, was one of the ones that was out there that we did work with. I mean, it was it was still very cumbersome because no one knew the rules, including the lender didn't know <laughs> what the rules were. And so um, what it allowed us to do is, and again, the initial plan was we could, multi we could multi-facet this thing because people were working on the, the new product. I could focus on the financial side of things. And um, it was very helpful from the perspective we would have brought everybody back to build these shields, but it gave us a little bit of a buffer to get through that and not have to worry about every dime. But uh, on the other hand, it, it's it's just, I think, you know, and I've had conversations with some um, people in Congress and uh, the point is, is uh, it was not well-defined when it came out, but we all learned a lot as we went. Yeah, sort of on the job training, right? Um, I have another audience question here, and uh, it's, do you see supply chain issues improving, and are you prepared if demand for your products increases? And I know, Erica, you said that simple things like groceries were uh, somewhat challenging at times. Um, you want to take the first swing at that one? Yeah, I do think that's improving. I, I hope it stays that way, but um, we are definitely less stressed out every Sunday um, than we were back in March and April. Um, one of the ways that we're prepared is, is um, we actually are controlling the number of subscriptions that we'll take on a week to make sure that um, we are able to, to get enough food and the space that we have reserved at the downtown market and our storage there. Um, so uh, we've just been kind of controlling our, our growth so that we can, can meet the demand, but at the same time, we are ready to pick that pick that up now. So, Steve, yeah, we um, at this point in time we don't foresee any supply chain um, problems right now. We've had the conversations of if we continue, um, we've had some conversations of if it gets busier, slower. You know, as far as that goes, um, you know, in our our core business uh, being automotive, obviously, then we have to throw in the weather because uh, with hurricanes and stuff like that, that kind of messes things up a little bit with supply chains, but we don't, we don't envision any real problems there. And uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, we're, we're being very cautious because we've, we've spent a lot of time, um, too much growth can be as bad as too little growth. And so we're just trying to make, be careful there too. So we're being very careful on how much we take. You know, the two key elements of, of any business are uh, product, materials, service, whatever it is you do, and the people who do it. And uh, I'm curious about, are either of you, or well, do either of you have a perspective on how your employees are holding up with the ongoing chaos in the world? Um, and do you have any plans for any kind of, I don't know, a, 
a COVID's over party at some point in time? Or how do you keep people engaged and and feeling good about what they're doing and and so forth? Uh, Erica? Yeah, just keeping open lines of communication. Um, I mean, one of the one of the things that's built our business is we listen to people. And so um, you know, a lot of our employees have young kids and there is some anxiety right now about what's going to happen with school. And, um, you know, for that reason, just, I just listen to, to their concerns and I don't push them to, to add on any more days or any more hours until they're completely comfortable. And I think that they know that their concerns are always going to be heard. And um, there, yeah, there's a lot of um, control in how much people want to work right now for, for me. So that's been good. Steve? Yeah, um, same type of thing. I think it's just critical that we we listen and, we, and we've had a lot of, I mean, I don't want to say a lot, but we've had people that are, you know, it's a very stressful time for certain people, especially little kids and school out and, and those types of things. And so it's just listening to them and hearing them. When we first got back to work, there was a little bit more concern when we were doing the shields of how are you going to protect us? Um, and I think that it open lines of communication, you know, we had all the cleaning supplies and, you know, just trying to reassure them that we're doing everything in our power to make them safe and feel comfortable and that we're all in this together. I'm sure both of you had to, you know, from a tactical perspective, uh, I'm sure both of you had to very quickly assess what you had to stop temporarily in order to respond to things and and uh, urgent matters brought on by COVID. How, how did you go about deciding what you had to stop temporarily or permanently? And I mean, a little bit about the decision-making process when you were in the eye of the storm, so to speak. Steve? Um, again, it, uh, being 25 years old, we've been through a few things as a company, um, but I think the- uh, Not your first rodeo. Yeah, exactly. And so, it does help a little bit. Obviously, it's a different scenario, but um, it really came down to you know the the decisions of okay, is this something that's going to help us in the next three to six months? Maybe okay, put it one pile. No, it's out. And you know, obviously, at times it was what's going to help us this week. And uh, you know, we just we kind of went through that. And you know, there's some things that we put on the back burner that were actually starting to talk about again now going hey you remember that last lifetime that we had we were looking at something we should look at that again so um it it became again it was it was helpful that it was you know open lines of communication it was a group effort that we could just look at it and go is this something we need to deal with today tomorrow next year so sort of triaging opportunities mm -hmm. nice segue to erica yeah, I like the way that you put that, Steve. If if we didn't need it in the next couple of weeks, it wasn't uh, it wasn't going to be purchased. So um, we do have some inventory, and and um, I I just stopped inventory purchases as far as like our supplements, and we have like little little food products like collagen, and um, we just cut the expenses and kept our inventory really low for that that type of thing. And then we weren't having to buy you know office supplies um, or th things like that. So. Yeah, just cutting out as, as much as we could. Um, question for Erica, with your team being home now, how do you make them feel connected to one another? Yeah, so we, we are back in, in the office now for the most part. We try to do as much as we can from home. So um, we, we have um, PPE here and we, we, we are in the office six feet apart, but we have a small team, so we're able to do that. But yeah, so I guess we have those days when we're still all together. Um, another question, this has certainly been a difficult challenge to face COVID. Have there been any, any, have there been any silver linings you can identify from this experience? Steve? Um, well, I guess one for us is obviously we have a new product that we can, we can hopefully work with. Um, 
I think it's it, the silver lining is that again, um, I come back to you know we you know our owner wants this company to be feel like a family, and I think um, the silver lining is we all did this together, um, and that it wasn't just one person did it or one group did it. We all did this together. We were we it was uh, it was interesting because. Um, with the demand that was there sometimes, you know, we were, we were having, we have three shifts. So we were having people working three shifts. And if we had a, a real spike for a week or something like that, uh, some of the office personnel would actually come in and go out on the floor and use one of those workstations and we're making products side by side with everybody. So that again, it just, it was the team. It reinforced our team mentality. Well, it's interesting because, uh, you know, your business has been around a long time. And I know um, the 2008 uh, financial crisis was another challenging time. And between having survived that and surviving the pandemic, uh, your team should feel like battle-hardened veterans. Maybe you should all go into teaching or something. <laughs> or be consultants. No, you can do that. Um, Erica, do you see um, opportunities, uh, opportunity, or talk to us a little bit about some of the opportunities that you were perhaps percolating on before things and you kind of put on the back burner, but um, in terms of follow on to what you've been doing, uh, what are some of those that you see? Yeah, we actually started working on some of it now. So we're trying to do what we do one on one with clients and move that more to online programs. So the last month we've been working really hard creating um, an online program where there's a series of videos and handouts and worksheets um, to, to mimic what we're doing one on one so that we can reach more people. And we're also going to start bundling our meals in with our clinical program. So um, the hope is that um, even for people who are having their meals shipped, they will still work with one of our dietitians so that they can still access our, our meals and our clinical um, consultations and the supplements that we recommend. So we're moving from more of a kind of individual one-on-one -on -one or meals to move, putting that all together um, into one kind of business that all goes together in more of a seamless fashion. It sounds like all of this is uh, helped you expand the geography that you serve because you can serve people remotely in a digital environment. Is that true? That's true, yes. What's the range of your business now? Are you going beyond the borders of Michigan or West Michigan? Yeah, we, we uh, work with clients um, virtually from all over the U.S. We have international inquiries, but I don't know how to do that yet. So um, we've had to decline those. Well, uh, we can help you with that. So <laughs> give us a call. Steve, what about you? What do you see in, in some of the, uh, the building you want to do on the foundation you've put together during COVID here? Um, again, I think we, uh, we just want to continue the, the process, the, the, the camaraderie that we've, again, re-emphasized and uh, our, our goal is to the medical supply. Um, actually, we wanna come up with a product line there and uh, offer other things as we, as we partner with some West Michigan hospitals and, and stuff like that. And so it's just kind of, it, it's gonna become more of a division per se than our, again, it's, it's so different for our core business. Um, another question I have uh, is, you know, obviously we haven't uh, flattened the curve the way we all hoped we would have, and we're approaching fall and back to school and flu season, and, and there's always a risk that this thing could really bloom again. Um, do you have contingency plans for if all of a sudden things kind of revert back to March and we're under another stay-at-home order? Steve? Um, we've talked about it. Um, I think that's the first step is to, to kind of talk about it. Again, 
I think it's similar to what happened in March, which is what does this mean? Um, obviously, there for a period of time, it was a complete shutdown of um, only critical functions. And so we've, we've kind of been through that. So if it's a critical function, um, there's, I think, I asked you, what's it gonna look like post COVID? Because, you know, we don't know and we don't know what two months is gonna look like. Um, if it's the same, I guess we'll just kind of react the same as what we did this time and let take lessons learned. Um, but I think we just need to talk about it and have options open. If I was so smart, I knew what was going to happen. I'd be retired and whiling away on some beach somewhere. <laughs> Wouldn't we all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Erica? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons we're pushing to get our online programs finished and spending the energy on it, just in case. That, it, that yeah. insulates you to a degree, doesn't it? Um, I have another question here, which I think maybe we've touched on, but uh, with the current COVID environment and the stress associated with it, family work, et cetera, are you seeing any employee burnout? And if so, how are you addressing it? Erica? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it made me pause and think right now, are my employees burned out? So that was <laughs> good, good to be aware of. Um, yeah, I, I haven't sensed it. We're, um, but I'm sure, I'm sure it's possible, especially with balancing home and, and work responsibilities. But yeah, we, we are a pretty close knit team. So I think just supporting each other and we all understand each other. I think that's one of our, our, our key things that we do. Steve? Yeah, similar. Um, there was probably some times where people were getting a little burnt out um, with things and then we just try to recognize it and you know okay recognize that okay is, is home life busy okay take a day off you know take care of that um, uh, but again it's it's nice to have a team surrounding you that says we're all in and whatever it takes we're going to get it done and you know um, our, our ownership is of the mindset that uh, you know you take care of me now, I'll take care of you, you know, you can take a break. And uh, so it's just listening and learning. Um, but as Erica says, you know, you always gotta be cognizant of the fact of, are we burning our people out? Well, I don't see any more questions in the, uh, the question box. Karen, um, are we ready to wrap things up here? Oh, one last question, actually. How have you each managed your own stress? Erica? Um, I, I actually started running a lot more again, so that was a, a, a good thing because um, in startup life, you kind of let exercise go to the side for a while and exercise has always been very important to me. So that's my stress relief, pounding the pavement. How about you, Steve? Um, yeah, just trying to make that time to just, for me, I'm not an exercise person, that's just who I am. Um, but I like to just relax and, you know, read a book or, or something like that. And it's just make sure that you take that little time out um, for yourself so you can re rejuvenate um, for the next day. And all of the fun that goes with it. Yeah. Dean Lawson. Thanks, Brooks. And thanks for moderating this panel. Steve and Erica, thank you for all of your insights, your expertise, and your willingness to talk about what's worked well and some of the challenges that you've faced. What I take away from this, we have a company that's been around for a while, 25 years, and one that's maybe not quite two years old yet, uh, both facing the same kind of challenges, yet there were some there were some common threads that I heard through this and the most important ones to me was number one, your focus on your people and making sure that everybody was safe, that everybody was, was working at the, at the level that they needed to in order to balance their health and their family and stress and everything else. And the other, other uh, big takeaway was your focus on agility and innovation. Uh, whenever there's any kind of crisis, 
uh, we that we have to step back and see what is it that we can do differently and clearly both of your organizations both of your companies have pivoted to different directions that you either didn't think about before or wouldn't have thought of quite yet because you were so busy focusing on what what you were doing today so i think those are great messages and great lessons for all of the people listening uh, and for people that if you know people who wanted to come today but couldn't this webinar will be on our website probably in about a week at, and you can get that at gbsu.edu forward slash seedman our next webinar is on the 25th of september it will be in collaboration with the grand haven chamber of commerce and the title is the allure of the lake shore so i um, hope you can come again uh, viewers and let others know that that will be on the 25th of september again thank you to steve and to erica for taking your time and good luck in your in your endeavors as you move forward and continue to innovate i will i Sure, we will see more and more changes and more and more innovation in both of your companies. Brooks, thank you for all of your expertise for your moder moderate moderating this uh, webinar. Everyone, have a great day. The weather is beautiful and it's going to be a nice week and take some time and enjoy it. Good afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.